Our plenary speaker is Dr. Susan Chang. Her, uh, she'll be talking about pandemic pressures and hard lessons on how population level disparities affect real people. Um, Dr. Uh, let me, uh, where are my notes here? Here we go. Uh, Dr. Chang is the Erica J. Glazer Chair in Women's Cardiovascular Health and Population Science. She's the Director of the Institute for Research on Healthy Aging and Director of Public Health Research at the Smith Heart Institute at Cedar Sinai. Dr. Cheng is a cardiologist, echocardiographer, and clinical scientist who leads research programs aimed at uncovering the drivers of cardiovascular aging in women and men. And what I can tell you is in our conversation, she also um, has uh, lots of expertise working at a community level uh, around, uh, in the last two years, around COVID, around cardiovascular disease, and has really become an expert in community-engaged research. Um, she received her master's degree from Harvard, her medical degree from McMaster University, and master's of science from MIT, and a master's of public health from Harvard. Um, she completed her internal medicine training at Johns Hopkins and cardiology fellowship training at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. She's the co-chair of the Ancillary Studies Steering Committee and co-director of Echocardiology Lab Laboratory at the Framingham Heart Study, which um, I'd like to mention brings her in connection to BU. She's a colleague of Dr. Ramachandran, knows Dr. Jacobs and Dr. Benjamin intimately through her work uh, through the Framingham Heart Study. So, um, and she has a, 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 a academic appointment at Harvard. She's offered over, uh, she has, she's served on the editorial boards of major cardiovascular and imaging journals, as well as on the leadership committees of the AHA and the American College of Cardiology. She's offered She's authored over 300 research manuscripts and serves as the PI on four NIH, NIH R01 grants and the contact PI for two NIH U54 grants. Um, with no further ado, I turn it over to Dr. Chen. Hi everyone. I think I'm connected and um, it looks like my slides are up. And um, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and um, that uh, wonderful introduction. I want to thank the organizers of this event, um, Chris, Raina, everybody, and um, so much thought and organization and I think um, vision has, has gone into this and it's really just a remarkable testament to um, what you're all doing at BU. I have a lot of slides and um, thank you for the time. I'm uh, going to hope to save some time at the end for some conversation because I think this is, it's such an important event and uh, this is obviously an important topic, but um, in many ways, I feel very uh, connected. I was, I was so delighted to be invited because, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into why um, I was delighted and, and very moved to be invited. Uh, as I go through the slides, I, th I think you'll see uh, why, and I, I'm hoping this will um, trigger some um, and, and motivate some important conversations as we move along through the day. Uh, next slide. So this is just a little bit about me. It's sort of a, it's not meant to be a personal CV, but the whole, the whole point of, of this slide is just to tell you where I've lived. Um, I'm Canadian. I, I've gone to school uh, in Boston. I did my training in Boston. I ended up at Cedar sinai because I got recruited here to develop um, cardiovascular population sciences programs. But the reason I have this is because I'm going to show you a slide a little bit later um, that I think is an important one. And it, it touches on why uh, the work that uh, you all are doing, already doing, and, uh, and about to continue to do is so important to me personally. And, and it's about where I've been. It's about the work that I've been trying to do along the way. Um, one of my, I, you know, I, I've got Harvard College here. I, I went to college at Harvard, but I, I like to say that my some of the formative experiences of um, education that I had uh, while I was in Boston um, were actually at BMC and at BU. When, when I was at uh, Harvard as an undergraduate, I got um, lucky enough to be connected to some people who were doing um, really ground level work uh, 
as part of a nonprofit that turned into now a national organization called called Health Leads. But um, it, it involved a, a group of us uh, undergraduates going to BMC and, and, and sitting in the waiting room of the pediatrics department and trying to figure out how to get uh, patients and their families um, basic needs uh, that were clearly uh, to address uh, issues that were clearly impacting their health, food stamps, um, access to uh, uh, supports that would help them pay for electricity bills, um, addressing needs like cockroaches in their apartments that were um, potentially triggering asthma attacks in children. And so a lot of my actual education, I, I like to say, was outside of the classroom. Similarly, although I did my cardiology fellowship uh, at the Brigham and, and Mass General, my real sort of um, education with respect to how to do research, how to ask the right questions, how to answer the right questions, actually uh, at the Framing Heart Study, which is, of course, um, uh, run by BU. So I, I feel very um, uh, grateful and connected and, and indebted to um, BU, BMC, and, and the entire institution um, for everything that I've learned along the way and I'm still learning. Next slide. So I was uh, recruited from um, uh, the Brigham Women's Hospital to go to Cedar sinai and, and, and expand the population health sciences um, endeavor. And it, we, we were starting this Institute for Research on Healthy Aging. We were um, making it interdisciplinary. We were really focused on uh, trying to use everything that we had available. And you know, for me, it was um, my research experience at the Framing Heart Study, uh, looking at how people age over time. And we wanted to really turn that around and, and, and really focus on um, healthy aging as a focus and as a theme. And then of course, uh, next slide. Um, this was in, uh, I arrived in around <laughs> 2018, we were just getting started. 2019 is when we started the Institute and of course the pandemic hit. And, and when the pandemic started um, in Southern California, uh, interestingly, um, Cedar sinai actually uh, hospitalized and treated one of the first uh, individuals to uh, get COVID uh, on um, on this continent, and it was uh, actually in the fall of of, uh, of 2019, and nobody fall to late uh, late fall to, to winter, and nobody really knew. But uh, our our institutional leadership and hospital epidemiologists actually had a sense. But of course, we didn't really see much of the wave. Seattle was the first epicenter. Um, I think that. Uh, you guys on the, in the Northeast actually had it um, harder, uh, sooner than, than we did. But uh, our time uh, was to come. And, and when it did, I was one of the few people on campus at Cedar sinai It's a really large uh, health system, um, uh, hospital system, not uh, itself an academic entity, but affiliated with UCLA. But, but really, based on numbers alone, I, I was one of the few faculty that had any formal epidemiologic training and experience. So they asked me um, and my team to start looking at the numbers. And we started looking at the numbers uh, just to try to understand what's going on in our, in our health system as well as um, learn from the experience of others in our health system. Um, clearly we saw uh, some of the disparities uh, just start to emerge that uh, everybody else did. First, it, it had to do with differences in uh, sex, or gender, and, and Primarily, it looked like bi biological sex was really um, driving a lot of the excess risk with respect to severity of illness in males compared, compared to females. We still see this, this a little bit with Omicron. We can talk about that later. Next slide. But I think around the country, and certainly um, our institution was no exception, um, the ethnic racial disparities were really quite stark. Um, Cedar sinai is a health system that's located really at the edge of Beverly Hills. This is actually one of the reasons why I, I thought twice before coming here. I thought, well, you know, um, do, do I want to work in a, in, a, in a health system or at a hospital that primarily uh, serves uh, an already resource uh, population? Well, it turns out Cedar sinai is actually located there, but it's actually quite large. Um, you know, we deliver six to 7,000 babies a year. It's, it's very, very diverse in terms of the, the patients that are treated. Maybe a little less so in terms of the outpatient environment um, because of the way our health insurance plans are covered, but certainly in terms of the inpatients, uh, we treat anybody and everybody uh, regardless of insurance status. And so, and we do have a lot of resources. And so anybody who got sick in our entire region, um, if they weren't already at a hospital getting um, uh, decent care or, or, or already situated, um, they were transferred to us. and. Um, so we didn't get absolutely everybody in, in LA County, but, but we got um, basically the, 
the majority, um, we were known as the hospital on the West Coast that had the highest volume of COVID patients during the first surge um, outside of Seattle. And so we uh, clearly saw, I mean, it was clear as day that there are ethnic and racial disparities that were persisting among the COVID infected, even as we got better at figuring out how to treat COVID in, in, in the inpatient environment, um, outcomes improved. Um, the disparities, of course, uh, persisted. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so, so my team got to work. We were asked by our institution to, to, to help out. We um, thought and hoped, like everybody, this was going to last just a few months. So we dropped everything <laughs> and we did everything we could to try to um, uh, f figure out what was going on, at least with our patients and, and people in our communities. One of the first things uh, we looked at, just because I mentor a, a very talented junior faculty member named Joe Ebinger, he's the senior author of this report. Um, he's an implementation scientist at our institution. He's able to get in and out of the ER, EHR and try to figure out uh, what patterns of care look like um, in addition to many other things. And so we found that uh, during the first lockdown and everything turned uh, remote that um, surprisingly, we weren't doing too badly with respect to uh, reaching uh, traditionally under under uh, service um, and under uh, represented uh, minorities um, with respect to cardiology visits. And that was sort of um, not necessarily, it was, a, it was a pleasant surprise. It meant that uh, we were able to reach people who otherwise were busy. And as we were coming out of lockdown, people were trying to um, get different types of uh, frontline jobs if they had lost or were on hold with respect to their usual uh, on-site job. Um, we were able to, uh, to reach people um, with, a, with a rate that wasn't too bad. And as things transitioned from telehealth to in-person, uh, sorry, to video uh, visits, replacing in-person visits, um, overall trends were, 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 not, were not too bad. We were very worried, of course, about um, certain subsets of our population. Next slide. So since I'm a cardiologist, you know, we really focus on the cardiology visits. We also focus particularly on heart failure, since heart failure, of course, can cause so much morbidity and mortality. And we noticed a trend, which is not surprising, that if your um, outpatient heart failure visit is um, a video visit, uh, your outcomes are um, almost just as good, if not just as good, with respect to uh, that, that visit having been uh, inpatient a year ago. Um, and if your uh, heart failure uh, visit is just over the telephone, your outcomes just aren't as good because the quality of the care, the ability for the provider and the patient to really engage around real issue, active issues uh, at that encounter, just, it's just not as good. Um, so that wasn't a surprise, but we wanted to describe, we saw it and we wanted to describe it. Um, and, um, and that was affecting obviously everybody. Um, next slide. So at the same time as we were doing this work, we actually um, had uh, a lot of people ask us for help in many different areas. One of the um, big calls that the institution made to us is they said, you know, Abbott as a company wants to uh, give us a lot of uh, tens of thousands of free antibody assays. They, they need something to do with this, but in particular, they of course want FDA approval for EUA, for EUA and um, use of this, um, of this assay. It still hasn't come to bear because we're really still not sure what antibody assays, what clinical utility antibody assays have to offer, but um, uh, it was an opportunity to engage uh, at, at first all of our healthcare workers in a large study to try to understand who at the, at the very outset had been exposed during the first first wave. And so um, during the lockdown, really everything, the first lockdown, if you recall, I'm sure you guys have the same experience, everything was shut down. There was um, really not much going on and people really need to work because they really need to uh, continue to earn their keep. And so everybody was um, ironically repurposed to this big research study and, and they lined up in a huge auditorium, all masked, um, socially dis physically distanced. And um, phlebotomists were um, repurposed to this effort and uh, thousands of healthcare workers were interested and willing to get their blood drawn to um, get their antibodies measured so we could just understand what the uh, exposure rate looked like it had been based on uh, antibodies as far as COVID-2. Um, so this was, this was a first foray for us into a very rapid um, COVID research. Again, we were still hoping that this would all be uh, gone within a few months. We would sort of get through this, learn, learn a few things, understand uh, patterns of susceptibility um, and resistance, and hopefully uh, get through. Next slide. But of course, um, the pandemic has 
had continued, still does uh, to some degree. And, um, and we had now this responsibility. <laughs> it wasn't just sort of, uh, you know, a temporary mission. It was really a responsibility to continue trying to delve into um, what's going on with our uh, patient population as well as our communities because we were accumulating data. People were interested in antibodies. And uh, now, because things were returning, uh, not quite back to normal, of course, but we were out of lockdown and everybody was trying to get back to uh, business as usual through more um, telehealth uh, uh, means. Uh, we um, we still had no idea what was going on. No, nobody else did either, other than vaccines were hopefully coming. And we still saw very, very persistent patterns of uh, susceptibility across our patients. And again, of course, across um, uh, minority populations within our patients who tended to do the worst. And so we, we had the infrastructure set up and we applied for a lot of grants. Uh, we got a few of the many, or of the dozens that we applied for, and it now became a very competitive space. We got a few grants and we were able then to uh, start a program that uh, we thought was going to be then two years. Well, it's going to be a few months, but then two years. And since then, because the pandemic has, of course, continued, we've expanded the program uh, to be uh, open, not just to the groups that we were initially um, able to recruit on the left, but to a broader number of, of groups of patients. And that's all patients represented on the right uh, in these cartoons, uh, where we're trying to better understand how people are doing as they move through and coming are coming out of the pandemic. And essentially, I'm going to start to show you some of the things that we have uh, learned along the way. And I, I think the major issues, the major problems really have to do with the huge gaps of lack of knowledge that we continue to recognize persist um, and that we struggle with um, uh, still to this day. Uh, next slide. So this is, again, it's the, the Abbott um, partnership that really drove our ability to collect all of these data points. Every single data point is a blood draw for a participant uh, in our study. And because that's what we had to work with, um, we really did what we could to um, uh, publish from the findings from the antibody results. We, we tried our best to do the Framing Heart Study style of collecting very carefully comprehensive, complete data with respect to how patients themselves are doing, what they're willing to report on a survey, e-survey, as you have it, um, something electronic that goes to their phone that uh, returns to a red cap. And it's very hard, as, as you know, we just can't do as well as we can in Framingham. We don't have that level of patient uh, participant loyalty and engagement. So the, the best quality data we have is, is the antibody data. Um, from that, we're able to glean some patterns with respect to the, the darker and lighter lines here in terms of the blue, the IgG2 spike protein, which is what you get not only after exposure to vaccine, uh, but also to virus, um, represents uh, male and female. And there's really no, initially there's a difference. Females re respond a little bit better, a little bit higher with respect to antibody um, to the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein um, after vaccine, but then there's uh, a evening out over time. And then when, uh, the red uh, dots and, and the lines, males and females are represented there in terms of the response to uh, the nucleocapsid, which is the um, inner part of the virus. And uh, that represents uh, uh, exposure to um, uh, actual uh, uh, natural infection. And so you can see what we've experienced over time through uh, the data. And uh, what we've done is we've used the data to try to understand where there are disparities or where there are differences in response, not only to vaccine, but also a response to, um, to the virus, at least in terms of what antibodies can tell us, which is really just a mere reflection of the actual uh, total immune response uh, to these exposures. Uh, next slide. So um, we are the, um, the one of the leading heart transplant programs in the country and the world. We also do a lot of transplants and uh, for other organ systems, uh, lung, kidney, kidney especially, um, pancreas. And so our organ transplant recipients are particularly um, vulnerable and they continue to be vulnerable and, and they know it and we know it. And, and so that's why we, um, their vulnerability is a focus for us in terms of patient level disparities. Next slide. Uh, cancer patients have, have been also a very much a concern for us. Um, it's very mixed. So when you sort of lump everybody together in terms of uh, cancer, wh whichever, whatever patient you're looking at, whether it's in the clinic or you know, in the ER or on the wards, um, it's mixed. It, it, it's mixed in terms of whether it's solid tumor, um, um, hematologic, um, they're more at risk. The, the, 
the folks with hematologic um, uh, malignancies, and then uh, the degree to which they're being actively treated, particularly if they're on a checkpoint inhibitor uh, versus not. And so there's a mixture, there is vulnerability, um, but, but there's a mixture, um, which is not surprising. We have cancer, uh, colleagues in cancer who are, who are focused on these questions in particular. Next slide. And then of course, I'm a cardiologist, so we care in particular about heart disease. And you can see that the gray line represents the average response, at least to vaccines. That's really what I'm focusing on here, I should have mentioned. And we're um, you know, focus here on the blue, green, with green shade line, which is the average response among, in this, in this line, heart disease uh, patients, patients who self-identified on survey and then validated in the EHR to have some kind, any kind of chronic heart disease, um, coronary heart disease, heart failure, um, uh, and so forth. And they are definitely below average in terms of uh, their response. There's, there's something about their ability to mount an immune response to a uh, vaccine um, that is not the same in individuals with a chronic um, a heart condition compared to average. And so there is some crosstalk, something uh, with respect to, and we don't know yet, is, does that have to do with um, the ACE2 uh, receptor uh, related pathway? Um, does it have to do with just overall um, compromise uh, immune uh, ability to mount an immune response in patients who tend to be older. We, we adjust actually for age, sex, all the usual variables, and we still get this, um, we, we get a response uh, and a finding that looks a little bit like this. So this is something we're still looking into. Next slide. And this is, um, of course, at, at the end of the day, why we're here. We, we essentially then, of course, go back and we look at uh, whether or not there are disparities or differences in demographics, and there really aren't. So this is actually, it's good news and it's, it continues to be uh, provocative and provoking because really they, we shouldn't have and we, we don't, we don't see any differences with respect to race or ethnicity, with respect to response to vaccines. So really everybody, good news is everybody responds. Everybody should be able to derive the same amount of immunity um, outside of their pre conditions, outside of um, whether they have organ transplant status, heart disease, cancer with active treatment. Everybody, regardless of who they are, there should not be a biological reason or difference. Uh, with respect to response to vaccine. Um, and I know we're squinting here at the lines at the very bottom, the red lines, but with respect to response to a virus, it should also be similar. So this begs the question, you know, why are people, uh, certain people, certain seg segments of our population, in particular minority, minority subsets, um, getting sicker and or appearing maybe not to respond as well to vaccines. Certainly there's a lot of vaccine hesitancy, that's an, another issue. But in terms of the biology, uh, the response should really be the same, whether it's to vaccine or to, um, or to natural virus. Uh, next slide. So here are these numbers that, you know, these are now, um, you know, not updated. Um, this is from April. Um, but it's historical. It's, it's obviously just summary numbers going back to, you know, what everybody was seeing from the start of the pandemic in terms of the disparities. And I know, I know you saw this in, in your own, uh, on your awards and your ICUs. Uh, we saw the same. Um, this marked um, excess in morbidity and mortality associated with COVID among our um, American uh, Indian or Alaska Native non-Hispanic persons. Um, Black or African American uh, patients, Hispanic uh, Latinx uh, patients. The, n none of this is a surprise uh, because we've been living with this, seeing this, and living with this. And we also see this, you know, we saw this pre pandemic. We saw this for heart attacks, we saw this for strokes, and we see this for cancer outcomes. Um, this, because it's COVID and it's a pandemic, and it, you know, was the, uh, has been the crisis of our, uh, of our moment in history. Um, it's much more obvious. Um, next slide. So here's where we went back now to the data, not just our own data, because we know our own data is really representative only of our health system, although we're a large diverse um, community and um, we serve a large diverse community uh, and large segment of the, uh, of the metropolis of, um, of Los Angeles County. We know that um, we're just still one part of one corner of, of the country, not even one corner. So we turned to a CDC national vital statistics recently, and we started to look at trends. And I just want to, again, I'm a cardiologist, but um, this is a window, I think, into um, what's going on with this first. We have certainly no answers, but this, I think, 
continues to uh, lift the lid or, or unpeel, I think, um, what is um, what is part of the problem that we've experienced directly and that we continue to observe with COVID. These are AMI death rates, so acute myocardial infarction death rates. So these are heart attack associated deaths that um, are counted, calculated, and plotted leading up to the pandemic. So the pandemic uh, time period is everything after the uh, vertical dash line. So leading up to that point, if you count, which the CDC does a good job of, um, heart attack associated deaths uh, per 100,000 persons, you see, not surprising as a cardiologist, we know this, the heart attack associated deaths are high in the winter versus the summer months. There's a seasonal variation that we've known about for a long time, and that seasonal variation has to do with a, a lot of issues um, and even occurs in uh, warmer climates like California, but certainly they're in Massachusetts. And over time, over decades, um, as a field, the cardiovascular field has been doing a, and in public health in general, we've been doing a great job at bringing the um, heart attack associated, the MI death rates down over time. And of course, COVID just completely reversed that. <laughs> so this is decades of, of work done by, you know, great folks and, and leaders. You, you have an enormous number of great leaders at BU who have been part of the American Heart Association, folks like Amelia Benjamin and others who have uh, worked to um, catalog um, not only what's been going on, report on it, but also uh, contribute to, and especially the framing heart study itself, identifying risk factors that we need to be on top of as, as specialists and as generalists. Um, to, to decrease um, heart attack associated risks in general. And that really was having an impact up until the pandemic when, of course, you know, all that, um, all that, all that gain uh, was reversed. What we did here is we, 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 we tabulated using the data uh, what the excess risks look like, especially if you were to use the trends from you know, the last um, decade or so to predict what it should have been had there been no pandemic. And the excess risk is really highest in uh, the younger age group. So, you know, younger age people are really not supposed to die of heart attack, right? Um, but the excess risks is highest. Now it's relative because the absolute rates are still lowest in the younger people, but the excess risk is highest. It, and it tells us a few things. It, it suggests to us, and of course it's also excess in males. And we saw that um, we've, we've seen the male, uh, female difference from the very beginning of the pandemic in our ICUs. But if the excess risk is highest in, in youngest, uh, in the youngest group of people, as well as in males, it tells us that there's something going on with respect to a heart attack associated um, um, death and risk in, um, in the population in a pattern that has more to do with who's more likely to be out in the community getting the infection. It has more to do with uh, patterns of susceptibility as opposed to uh, uh, patterns of who's more likely to get ill from an infectious disease that can cause a pneumonia. And, and so this is uh, an important signal for us. We just got this little piece published and, and, and there's more, next slide. Um, this is just a, another way of looking at uh, same data. That's just by age and sex, looking at who is experiencing the excess risk of AMI associated uh, death, whether with or without a COVID uh, illness. And of course, you know, if it's non-COVID related, it doesn't mean it's, you know, they didn't have COVID that might've triggered or somehow been related or um, or, or cause um, that that event to happen in some indirect way. Um, and then COVID related means that you know, they were coded with uh, COVID at the, at also at the same time um, on, on the death certificate. But again, you see that the purple, the darker part, purple part of the bars is, is really more pronounced for the uh, youngest age group in terms of the excess. So it's, it, it really seems to track again more with the people who are getting um, the infection and more or less you would expect or hope are, are, are walking away uh, from the infection unscathed um, with successful recovery. But we know, of course, from our experience with long COVID that that is not unfortunately always the case. In fact, it can be very much the opposite. Next slide. And so when we look at this um, uh, excess risk and what it uh, looks like over time by race and ethnicity, not surprisingly, the excess risk is in um, Hispanics and, and non-Hispanic Blacks. Uh, and I'll come back to uh, something like this slide in a little bit. Um, next slide. If we basically take the modeling that I uh, mentioned earlier, where we try to predict if there were no pandemic, 
what things should have looked like leading up to the vertical dash line, which is when the pandemic um, essentially started. You can see that the excess risk of heart attack associated death during the pandemic is really the highest. I'm showing the gap here with the vertical red lines uh, for Hispanics as well as non-Hispanic Blacks. Again, not surprising, but um, we are, as, as cardiovascular epidemiologists, we've been following who's at risk for heart attack and heart attack associated deaths for decades. And, and, and those of you who are cardiologists and have done this work in epidemiologists and cardiovascular in the cardiovascular field, you know this, we've been um, uh, sort of puzzled and, and intrigued by something, the so-called Hispanic paradox in cardiovascular uh, medicine, which is that although Hispanic Latinx um, subsets of the population appear to have a lot more of the risk factors for cardiovascular uh, endpoints, um, diabetes, obesity, uh, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, and so forth, they, they, tend, they have tended to historically up until this moment, up until now, pre-pandemic, they, they tend to not have or experience the actual heart outcomes, uh, MI, heart attack associated death, um, to the same degree. In fact, you know, paradoxically lower. That is now clearly not the case. Right? So, so we've now seen essentially a reversal of the Hispanic, the so-called Hispanic paradox, and there are a lot of debates and I think very good arguments made around why you know that even existed as a term before. Next slide. And so, um, just to this is just summarizing what I just said, which is that. There have been dozens, hundreds of reports about the Hispanic paradox leading up to the pandemic in terms of this, you know, in, intriguing um, sort of phenomenon that, you know, Hispanic Latinx um, uh, individuals will make up by 2025, probably a quarter of the U.S. population. So I'm part of also a, a study called the Hispanic um, Community Health Study, study of Latinos. The whole study was founded uh, from the uh, by the NHLBI specifically to look at this paradox, to look at this issue, and um, and we I mean, look at look at the late leading right before we now see uh, a reversal. And again, this to us, if you go to the next slide, re-emphasizes um, the fact that the excess. You know, we're talking about heart attacks. We're talking about pneumonia, ERDS being on the ventilator, or even long COVID. We're talking about heart attacks that are not really supposed to be directly related to COVID, and yet we're seeing excess risk in the populations that we know are the most susceptible to infection, even mild infection. And we're now seeing um, these trends persist all the way through uh, Omicron. And so I think this is th this part uh, of the presentation as we move forward is, is probably, I think, one of the most important pieces, which is for a large subset of our population, this is not over. The, the issues and the risks continue, and they're continuing through Omicron, because if you look at the rates for especially non-Hispanic Blacks and Hispanics, the, the rates, if anything, they're maybe possibly a little higher during Omicron, and Omicron is really supposed to be, you know, the better, milder, less virulent part of, of the pandemic for us. Next slide. And this is just uh, more um, uh, data essentially showing um, uh, the same thing, but now in a, a lot more stark um, sort of coloring where again, Omicron, the, the Omicron era is supposed to be this the safer era because for the most part, many of us have been vaccinated and, um, and, and most people are not going to the hospital or having to go to the hospital uh, for COVID. And yet when we count deaths uh, and heart attack associated deaths, we, we continue to see uh, these that this excess in particular, we're seeing it around the surges. And again, we're not, we weren't supposed to see that many hospitalizations during Omicron, but of course we all did. And those hospitalizations uh, in essentially are another pretty stark, obvious um, example of disparity that only some people see and, and many uh, parts of the community want to ignore and, and pretend, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not a big deal. Next slide. So this is where we've mapped um, with, with line plots, uh, the excess. And um, I, I know I essentially just keep showing you slides that, that emphasize the same point, um, but I think it's, it, it's, it's deserving of, of emphasis. And that's what we're doing it during Omicron. We're seeing that the, the spike during the surge, the excess is there. We are probably going into another surge. This data just through March of, of this year. And um, 
I, I predict we will uh, continue to see these disparities. Next slide. Uh, next slide, I think we just maybe a double. So why? Um, there are clues from data published by others early in the pandemic. So John, Jonathan Cunningham is actually, um, was a fellow, is now a training faculty at the Brigham and, you know, of the millions of papers that are out there on MedArchive, uh, the print uh, servers, as well as um, uh, in PubMed, um, it's hard to keep track of anything, but because uh, I've, I career mentored uh, John, I, I looked at this, I, you know, I knew about this publication that he and uh, Scott Salmon and others uh, published. And essentially, you know, why young people? Remind, like, before we even get to, um, you know, ethnic racial minorities, in particular Hispanics and, you know, reversal of the Hispanic paradox, why young people? Um, well, it turns out if you look carefully at the data, the risks are in a young person who usually has at least one risk factor. So now this is making more sense. So thinking back to the so-called Hispanic paradox, if you have a younger person and and maybe, I know they adjusted for race and ethnicity here, but maybe that younger person is more likely to be Hispanic, Latinx, um, Black, um, of, or, or of a family where they have had early onset hypertension, obesity, metabolic syndrome, early onset diabetes. That's the only risk factor they have. They don't have anything else, but that's enough. You only need one risk factor to now suffer or experience really, really high risk for a bad outcome if you get COVID. You're much, much less likely to go out your business after a few days of uh, sniffles and mild illness than your colleague or coworker at work who's similarly aged if they don't have a risk factor. So just having one risk factor, obesity, especially morbid obesity, hypertension, or diabetes, even in a young person, puts you at much, much, much higher risk of a very bad outcome in the setting of COVID. And maybe this is really, you know, obvious, but for me, when we sort of looked at the data at sort of like the, a higher level and put it all together, um, it, it started to, to make sense. You know, this, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is just, it's incredibly opportunistic, incredibly opportunistic. It will essentially take advantage of a situation where the vulnerability is even mild, very mild with respect to a pre-existing uh, chronic chronic um, health profile. Next slide. And so this is now going back to data from our, our institution where we said during Omicron, even among people who've had three boosters in our system, we can see how many vaccine doses they've had. So, so three, two initial doses as part of the primary series, a booster, um, so they're going into the Omicron, so this is now historical data from the last uh, several months, from last year, they're going to the Omicron surge. If they get Omicron, what percentage of them don't have to go into the hospital? Certainly a higher percentage, which is great, it's about 85%, but still 10 to 15% have to go into the hospital because their illness severity is that bad. Um, who are those people? It turns out it's not just the people with solid organ transplant or cancer, it's people who have sometimes, in some cases, just hypertension. So just ha having hypertension alone, even during Omicron, even after already having received all your requisite doses of vaccine, uh, puts you at high risk for, for a bad outcome. And we know for a fact that people walking around our communities with just hypertension are, it's, it's, it's a fair number of people, it's a lot of younger people, and it's a lot of younger people who happen to uh, live in communities um, that uh, don't have uh, all the resources or access uh, that would be optimal for controlling their blood pressures, that's one issue. And for a variety of different reasons, uh, hypertension tends to be prevalent as well as um, less uh, well controlled among communities of color. Next slide. Um, and so we're going back now to this excess risk, uh, trying to um, think about why this exists. And it's not just about biology, although I'm, I'm picking on hypertension, I'm a cardiologist, so I care a lot about it because it's something we usually overlook. We see blood pressure in the clinic all the time and we say, you've got a lot of other problems, let's focus on those. We also need to think about your blood pressure a bit. And maybe it's easier, maybe it's not. And you know, there are issues with getting on top of all your meds. But I, I think a lot now about blood pressure in, in our patients who've had COVID um, or who are struggling with, with long COVID even. Next slide. Um, we're, we're thinking now a lot about uh, reinfections and who's at risk for reinfection because if you have hypertension, just hypertension, you're a young person, you're a person of color, you have run one risk factor, one cardiovascular risk factor. It means that you're at risk overall if you get if you had COVID and you made it through great, but this is this is here and people are getting COVID a second time and a third time. This is just you know us tracking using antibodies and, and other things to figure out who, who's getting reinfected. Next slide. 
So this is work that's not published yet, but I want to emphasize that the, the, the primary message is about, you know, sort of the expected, although we feel that the, you know, the, the, um, the public health message still needs to get out there that if you don't have an, if you're not up to date with your vaccines, or you have a very, very severely immunocompromising state, you are at risk for reinfection. But I want to show you something we, um, and I'm, I'm sort of embarrassed to say this, but uh, it's, it, we did it on purpose. We allowed it to be buried, and that's the top, the top section of this figure where you see his, Hispanic ethnicity and non-white race. We lumped non-white race. We, not, we lumped a lot of uh, people self-identifying as different racial, uh, as being part of different racial groups into non-white versus non-Hispanic white. But if you uh, uncouple that, if you disaggregate that, there is signal there. And I'm burning it here for a reason because with all of the research that's been on COVID and all the reports, these things get buried and overlooked if they're not emphasized. So we, we plan to emphasize this difference. We left it in gray here. It's not the main part of this message, but because A, it's, it's surprising and disappointing to see that when you uncouple the racial categories, you rerun the model, there's significance there in terms of susceptibility to reinfection for non-Hispanics and non-Hispanic Blacks. And we want to devote a separate specific report to this because we want to somehow figure out what the best way is to explain. This is not biological. We saw the antibody results from before. It's not biological. It's not about there being some kind of intrinsic biological susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2. The virus doesn't care the color of people's skin or how rich or poor they are. The virus goes where it wants to go. It will take advantage of any crack in the armor, any you know single presence of vulnerability, even if it's just hypertension, it will take advantage of that. But it otherwise goes wherever it wants to go. And so when we saw the, our data here, we struggled. I had like so many meetings with our analysts and our you know, junior investigators around this issue um, or, or on what to do here. And it brings us back to, so I think why in particular we're here today. Next slide. So lots of articles, lots of recognition at the global front as well as nationally and, and, and region locally with respect to the inequalities and, and what's you know what's been exacerbating these inequalities and ultimately and you know this this is really obvious it comes to social determinants of health and what does that really mean how does it translate uh, next slide i'm actually running out of room so um uh, we have a, a new um uh, chief of health equity christine harris who's who's shown on the upper left and it's funny because i told her i was we're working together at cedar sinai to um, try to figure out initiatives, ways, programs uh, around how we can improve health equity at seniors, not in terms of patient care and health delivery, but also in terms of our research programs and so forth. And she said she, she was just recruited to come to us from UCLA. So she was at UCLA for many years. She said, I was at UCLA just several months ago, and we had a talk given to us by Thea James. And she said, oh my gosh, it was amazing. I wanted to quit my job at UCLA and come work for her. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not surprised. You know, the, the, the folks at BU, they're, they're really the leaders in this space. But she gave us a talk, and this is literally just stolen from Christina. And, um, and she gave us a talk, you know, essentially emphasizing this point with respect to all the different determinants of health beyond the labels or the surface, you know, appearance of, you know, the issue being, you know, race and ethnicity. You know, it's, it's because they're Hispanic, it's because they're black. Let's just move on. And, you know, it's, it's just the, the difference is there. We, we really don't want to stop there. I'm compelled by many issues uh, represented by the slide, but in particular, one that we've been struggling with in parallel. So we picked up some of our other work in, <laughs> while doing COVID work. 50% can be traced back to your zip code. And that we, a lot of you, we know, we know this, but if you go to the next slide, so Joe Emiger, one of my <laughs> star um, uh, tr faculty trainees has been working on, uh, he's also a cardiologist, so working on some other issues. He, he came up with this idea, he said in LA County, um, where are cardiac rehab locations? Cardiac rehab is essentially you know, evidence-based, lots and lots of data showing that you need cardiac rehab to optimize your recovery and really minimize your outcomes in a very significant way after heart attack or heart failure or having you know, very significant um, chronic cardiovascular disease. But where are these facilities located? Cardiac rehab means you have to go to an actual facility that has resources there, that has exercise physiologists, nutritionists, a cardiac rehab specialist to guide your recovery.
Where are they located in LA County? Well, it turns out, not surprisingly, they're located in areas that are really difficult to physically reach and access if you're somebody who lives in a poor neighborhood and who happens to more likely be a black um, uh, American Indian, Alaskan Native, or Latinx. And, and we thought when we discovered this, well, not surprising truth, we, we should get a lot of attention. This should change policy. We should get, you know, the California State um, and Department of Public Health uh, folks to create vouchers and, and try to incentivize people who run, build and run credit, credit rehab programs to, you know, open up facilities, do whatever they could in the underserved um, regions. And this got published and we tried to get attention uh, to, the, to the data and um, it got like no attention. We're highly, highly disappointed, but it got no attention. This is just an example of where the resources that are required are um, are just not there. Um, next slide. Um, this is where it all comes back. I thought why well, I should show the first slide at the beginning, like where I've been, where I've worked. So when I was a med student in Canada, I took an I did an elective at, at Yale, uh, at Yale New Haven Hospital with um, outcomes researcher um, and who's famous in the cardiovascular field, Harlan Krumholtz. And I was tasked, my first project was to um, look at data from 800 people enrolled. They it all had some kind of uh, critic event and they enrolled and they were trying to understand um, knowledge of the risk factors of high cholesterol and, and, and high blood pressure. And I looked at the data, I'm learning SAS for the first time. I'm like, you know, most of the people in my data set are white, Caucasian, or you know, that's what the data are telling me. And I, I turned to you know one of my colleagues, you know she'd been a research nurse for many years, and I said, um, why, "Why are the data so um, homogenous?" And I'm a Canadian, so I'm, I was just still learning about like diversity in America. And she said, "Oh, you know that's because the patients were all recruited from Yale New Haven, and um, the um, you know there are a lot of blacks who live in New Haven, Connecticut, but they all go to St. Ralph's. They don't like to come to Yale New Haven Hospital for care. They don't feel like they get the best care here." That's just kind of a fact. Um, so it's too bad, but that's why we, we don't get um, a lot of diversity in our, in our research studies. And that really struck me. Uh, obviously, I'm just sort of a naive Canadian med student thinking this is, um, that, that's, that's really... now since then, you know, Yale New Hospital has acquired St. Raph's and now if they wanted to count the diversity numbers, they, you know, they look a little better on paper. But, but that was like kind of my first, one of my first experiences with respect to, um, this what I'm calling the prevalent disconnect. You you guys know this. I'm just sort of getting to you know sort of let you know my 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 experience and how I came to this realization. I did my residency at, at, at Johns Hopkins and at Johns Hopkins we saw everybody. Baltimore has a, a lot of um, very prevalent um, medical issues. Not 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 unlike you know what you see in Boston or New York, but the opioid epidemic was very 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 much um, present in Baltimore. Uh, starting decades ago, and we, we certainly saw that in our ERs and our in our wards. But again, we I, I, I experienced sort of the same um, phenomenon. Like I would see some patients in my clinic, or ask them where they got their care, or or not, or lose patients out of my clinic, or I'd see patients in the ER, and you could tell they um they more frequently the patients who um, uh, the patients who represented. Um, um, are, are black communities more often than not, um, and, and Hispanics, but mainly the, the black patients tended to want to get their care at the University of Maryland Hospital that was uh, down the street, rather than the famous, you know, Johns Hopkins Hospital. And I would hear this from my patients, and they would say, you know, I, I, I just prefer going there. Um, sometimes I come here because I feel like I might have something that nobody else can diagnose, but in general, that's where I, I'd rather go because I would work really hard to try to develop relationships with my patients, just like you, you know, anybody would. Um, and then later, I, you know, did my uh, fellowship at, at at the Brigham, and it was really the same thing. You you guys know this. It, it was the same thing. I you know I'd, I had come from Hopkins where you know because so many people with so many acute and, and chronic medical issues are black. We, we 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 treated everybody and saw a lot of diversity regardless because we were in Baltimore. And when I got to the Brigham, I said, you know, this is a diverse city. I know I did undergrad here, but I'm not seeing that diversity as a cardiology fellow, uh, you know, on the wards. And the diversity is all, and I'm going over time here. You guys get the diversity. 
And, you know, make me go back and think, and if you just click once on the slide, um, and maybe remember and click one more time. Something that I experienced when I was, well, I didn't experience it. I heard about it and actually it, it moved me. <laughs> it was an experience that moved me. Um, I, spent, I spent a summer between the junior and senior year of college um, basically working for um, um, uh, what was um, this public service organization, uh, Partners for Improving Neighborhoods, Part for, Partners for Empowering Neighborhoods, actually a pen. And um, we worked primarily in, uh, not specifically Mission Hill, it's Jamaica Plain, um, it was Jamaica Plain area, but a lot of the, the students in our programs were, were from Mission Hill. And that's really, of course, if you uh, hit the button one more time, the area right under Huntington Avenue. And I remember towards the end of the summer hearing a story from my students um, who were, these are GED students and some were ESL students because I was volunteering, teaching uh, during that summer, um, staying in you know, student housing and then you know, taking the orange line to do this volunteering. I remember hearing, um, uh, it was, actually it was early in the summer, there was, um, but I heard about midsummer. Uh, the day of Harvard Medical School graduation that year, a resident of Mission Hill shot himself. Um, so it was pre-planned suicide and it was meant to be on the day of the Harvard Medical School graduation. And his family member said, this is a young person, his family member said it was in part protest because he felt that members of his family and or his community were, did not get the care they deserved at the Harvard Medical School hospitals. You can see, I mean, they, they live literally across the street, Huntington Avenue is a, it's a busy street. Um, and he committed suicide on the exact day of a Harvard Medical School graduation. And, and this was actually published in a, Mission Hill has a little um, paper newsletter. Um, and I'm sure there's nowhere online. I tried to find it, there's nowhere online. Um, people around the neighborhood talked about it and, and I heard about it. And I was so struck by this. I was incredibly sad, I'm still to this day, it's just sad. And I, I, I always look back and I think about it. And then I went back recently, I looked at this aerial view and the Brigham Women's Hospital is highlighted in blue. Mission Hill, but everything below, you know, those buildings below um, Huntington Ave are in red. That thing in green is the quad. If you've ever walked through the quad, it's very intimidating. It's, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. And you're surrounded by these like classic, you know, sort of white buildings. If you're a regular person living in Mission Hill and you need to go to the emergency room or you need to get care, and there's literally a hospital right there across the street in blue. You have to either walk around these fancy buildings and they're definitely not gonna walk through the quad. I mean, if you're, you know, you know, uh, asked by a security guard to leave, right? And so this to me, this is like a microcosm, but a very, very stark example of just one of the many problems, you know, we have. And so that's why I still, like to this day, I just, love your motto i you know i actually I, I sometimes show this to like my trainees and you know to, to to get them to think about it you know exceptional care without exception and so we, we try to do this in our research when we're asking questions i showed you the slide where you know i'm staring at the figure i'm staring at the data and it's like the obvious message is there you know for susceptibility to repeat infection all the bad things that can happen from repeat infection um it's obvious you need your vaccines and if you're or immunocompromised, you know, that, that's something that we need to do some, you know, try to pay attention to, maybe it's Evershield. But race and ethnicity persists. And I, I feel embarrassed. I feel like, you know, we're, we're failing here because we're, we're not sure what to do with the data. We're not sure what to do with these facts, but they're real facts and they have to do with problems that we have yet to scratch the surface in terms of solving. And I, know, I have some idea of what they are, but I know that there are things that I, I'm not right now in the position to be able to measure completely and comprehensively. Those are things like, you know, crowded housing, issues around, you know, better versus not as good, you know, um, insurance provider level, um, prejudice and bias, all, 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 all these issues. Um, next slide. Um, so, this is what I show sometimes to the, my, my, my audience if they're, 
you know, in, in positions to make, make a difference, which and at, the, at the end of the day, many of us are. Next slide. Um, and then this is just to emphasize at the end here. Um, we're going to continue to see these issues in part because what COVID has done is not just unlifted and unroofed sort of the disparities in terms of the outcomes, but COVID itself, whether you had the infection early, late, or not yet, um, or you know somebody who got vaccines, most people got vaccines, the rate of new diagnoses in our health system of hypertension, diabetes, all the things that put you at risk for having worse sequelae after at some point getting COVID again um, have all gone up. So this is the, these problems are going to continue, even though most of the rest of the world wants to think that we're hopefully moving out of pandemic and all this is hopefully just going to go away. Unfortunately, this is this is going to persist and unfortunately potentially get worse in terms of the downstream effects. Next slide. And we know that reinfections are happening because when we look at the antibody results, people are getting reinfected without even knowing because they don't have symptoms. Now that's maybe not a bad thing, but um, uh, we know that um, the after effects, um, uh, which do include long COVID on the one extreme, um, but the after effects that may be yet uh, unseen, but are, are probably going to happen, storing up um, propensity to develop diabetes and hypertension and things like that earlier rather than later are probably there. Next slide. So there's more work to do. Um, I think, you know, when I think about it, I'm almost overwhelmed by the amount of work that, that needs to be done. Um, but also recognizing that most of the rest of the world just kind of wants to move on, um, which I can completely understand as a, as a person <laughs> with a family and, you know, uh, a desire for the pandemic not to have happened. But based on at least what we see and what you guys have seen, what everybody has seen, um, we know there's a lot more work to do. Next slide. I'm sorry I've gone way over, um, but um, yeah, I probably should have cut some slides, but um, thank you so much for having me, for, for listening. And uh, this is, again, such an important um, venue, and, uh, and there's so much um, important information uh, and, and so many important conversations that need to be had. And, uh, and I, I really look forward to uh, learning more about what you guys are doing uh, these days at BU. Chris, we can't hear you. I think Chris is working on some yeah. <laughs> technical issues. Um, I, I don't know if there's even time for uh, q and I, I went way over. I apologize for that. And um, I know there, there, there's, a, there's a packed agenda. You guys have a lot of really great speakers. Yeah, well, maybe, yeah but maybe while we wait to see. Can you hear me now? Oh, here you go. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. I apologize. Um, Susan, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. I apologize for my uh, my little speaking problem here. Um, we are definitely behind. Uh, 
your talk was so excellent though and brought up so many issues that I know resonated with our with our group. If there's one burning question out there, I would love to have that opportunity. Um, but you gotta move fast in the audience. Uh, if there is a question, please um, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask it. Uh, I'll give you 10 seconds to do that. Otherwise we're gonna move on. <laughs> okay. Um, and I apologize, it's my fault. All right, I'm going to ask one quick one. Um, thank you so much, Susan. That was a great presentation. And I was just curious, have, have you been able to look at all around delayed care? And are there disparities in um, maybe being more fearful of getting care during uh, stressful times? And how does that play a role in excess uh, uh, morbidity? Yeah. Absolutely. There, there's definitely delays in care. We, we, sh we should try to publish this, but I'm, you know, we try to publish a lot of things and they get rejected. <laughs> um, and, and I think this would be like one of those, oh, ho hum, we, we sort of like knew that. But when we look, um, Hispanic, Latinx, and, and, and Black patients, when they sh by the time they show up to our ER with COVID, their vitals are worse. Every single index of severity of illness is worse. Their white count's higher. Um, their heart rate's higher, their blood pressure is either too low or too high, their oxygenation level is low, every single metric. So we know, even without them telling us, we know they've delayed care, absolutely. Um, thank you for answering that question. Th 